Hey there, YouTube. Baylor here, and today I want to talk about the events, specifically the events of Act 1 in Slay the Spire. This will be a tutorial-style video where I break down each and every event that you can encounter in the first act of Slay the Spire and talk about what the different choices are for each of the events and when you should take the different choices. Essentially, uh, how to decide what to do in Act 1 Events Guide. In the event that you find this video helpful, please feel free to like and subscribe below here, uh, as well as check out the other videos on the channel, or of course the live stream, which is here five days a week, producing top-notch content like this video. So to do this, we're gonna start uh, a run on Ironclad uh, on the highest difficulty. Ironclad's gonna have a really weird day in the Spire today though, not a not an usual run. Instead, this will be a demonstration of the event rooms of Slay the Spire, these unknown nodes. And to help me talk about them, we've got a couple of mods in play here that I'll, I'll mention briefly. The first of those mods is called Info Mod, made by community member OJB. This mod allows me to see uh, listed out all of the events in the game here. We can see actually broke down by act, how many there are, 11 in act one, 13 act two, seven in act three. These will each be done in a different video. And then the so-called shrines, more on that in a moment. So when you enter a question mark room in Slay the Spire, you never know what you're gonna get. The overwhelming likelihood is that you get an event of some sort, but uh, there are other possible outcomes, and these are so very tantalizing, uh, when you're, especially when you're new to Slay the Spire. The unknown rooms hold limitless potential, it seems. You never know what you're going to get, what you're going to get. Could be a relic, it could be something incredible, but the unfortunate thing about these events is that it can also be nothing, or it can even be a bad thing. You might get cursed, you might get hurt, you might lose money or you might simply not benefit at all. And Slay the Spire is very much a game where getting advantage as much as possible is essential. So a quick word of advice to you event, event hunters is to not take too many events in an act of Slay the Spire, especially not in Act 1. Because you need card rewards for your deck to actually become stronger uh, and be able to take on the greater threats of the Spire. Uh, as we go through the events here, I'm probably going to talk about how having better cards in your deck makes the result from the events a little bit better for you. So Ironclad's going to take a starting bonus here and go on an unlikely adventure here with the assistance of console commands. I am going to have Ironclad do the first fight here, so make sure we're actually on the map. Uh, and then with the assistance of console commands, Ironclad's going to explore for us all of the different events you can get in Act 1. We're just going to go through them in order here. So, there are 11 different events you can encounter in Act 1. Uh, nine of them are possible to encounter right at the beginning of the game, and two of them have a floor restriction. They can only be found on floor 7 or later, the Dead Adventure and the Mushrooms. So, more on that in a moment. We're going to go through all the ones that we can encounter right now, starting with Big Fish, a classic. So I type, um, click proceed here, and then I type event big fish. And we observe the first of many Act 1 events. This is a, a classic here. As you make your way down a long corridor, you see a banana, a donut, and a box floating about. Upon, no, upon closer inspection, they are tied to strings coming from holes in the ceiling. There's a quiet cackling from above as you approach the objects. Do you do? Three choices in this one, and uh, three options that are are pretty pretty useful, if you ask me. Um, this one is a classic example to me of option value. Taking any one of these choices means you don't get the benefit of the other choice that you could have gotten. So here you're offered a large heal, a bonus to your max health, or a relic in exchange for one regret curse. Note that the max health, uh, sorry, note that the heal like most heals is proportional to your maximum health here. I believe this is a 30% heal or such. My usual philosophy for this one is that if you're missing enough health to heal for the full value that the banana heals you, you should definitely take the banana. 
Um, but otherwise, you should probably consider the donut for five max health. And rarely, if ever, should you think about taking the relic. Reason is that the regret curse is particularly bad, gonna chip away health from you. So unless you have a way to remove that curse very quickly, this, uh, this penalty will be very, very strong. And in addition to that, uh, the relic that you get is not likely to make up for the curse. Uh, even if you do remove the curse, you'll still be a card removal behind compared to if you'd removed a starter card. More concerningly, not are you getting not only are you getting a curse, but you're losing out on the opportunity to gain one of the healing options. So the way I like to think of this is uh, obtain a relic, lose five max health, and get a curse. And that's a very, very a particularly bad curse too. That's a very, very bad trade. I think you only want to consider taking the curse here if you have uh, the Omomori, which will block the curse entirely, um, or if you have a another relic that interacts with curses that uh, is going to make this regret a lot less worse for you. For example, you've got a Duvu doll for plus strength. It, it might be worth thinking about, but still could be not worth it. Uh, if you've got a, a way to guaranteed remove that curse easily, like a peace pipe, then it might be worth considering, but I'd, I'd still advise to remove something else, if possible. And the game even lets you know that you've made the wrong choice if you take the relic for the curse here. You grab the box. Inside, you find a relic. However, you really crave the donut. You're filled with sadness, but mostly regret. And that's what you feel after uh, after taking the curse, is regret. Because that curse is going to hurt. And adds up. A lot. So my advice, take the heal if you need it. Otherwise, take the donut, but don't fall. Don't fall for that uh, that stinky trap. So what's next? The Golden Idol, another Act 1 classic here. You come across an inconspicuous petal with a shining gold idol sitting peacefully atop. Looks incredibly val valuable. You don't see any traps nearby. You're offered the Golden Idol. This relic will give you 25% more gold for the rest of the run. And I recommend that you almost always take the Golden Idol. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is that the Golden Idol giving you 25% more gold is actually pretty good. By the end of a run, this will be in the realm of 200 to 250 additional gold, depending on how early you got it and what ascension level you're playing on. And that's enough to buy another common relic and a half or a couple of card removals or many cards added to your deck. You can get quite a bit of purchasing power out of this money. There's also a couple of events later in the game. We'll actually end up talking about those in the Act 2 and Act 3 event videos, where you can trade in the Golden Idol for a benefit of some sort, either turning it into healing in Act 2 via the Bloody Idol, or turning it into more money in Act 3 via the Moai Head. So there's a potential you could get an additional payout on the Golden Idol. The last reason the Golden Idol is almost always worth it is because you get to choose your price. You have to take one of three downsides if you click the Golden Idol. But because you're allowed to choose which one you suffer, uh, you're almost always able to take a trade that's worth it here. Generally speaking, I don't recommend taking a curse. You'll see a, a theme recurring here, which is advice against taking curses from events. Uh, rarely is the benefit worth it for the player, because the downside of having a curse in your deck really, really adds up quick. But as before, if you have a relic that interacts with curses, such as a Darkstone Pyriapt, it might be worth taking the injury here. Pyriapt, Omomori, um, Duvudal, or Blue Candle can all make it a bit more tolerable. If you've got a lot of health to spare and you expect to be able to heal it back, or if you expect to be able to beat the remaining threat of the act without taking much further damage, then you can take the large amount of damage uh, here, the smash. This is 30% of your health. Uh, we're seeing these events as they appear on Ascension 20, but I'll try to mention when appropriate where the Ascension 15 modifier modifies these events, and this is one of them. The numeric value on smash and hide is increased by Ascension 15 here, so you lose more max health or take more damage. Um, and this, this damage can, can kill you quite easily in Act 1, so I, I do usually recommend against Smash as well, unless you've got a lot of healing you're coming your way, such as a, an early uh, Ironclad with a Burning Blood to heal, or you've picked up uh, something like the Meat on the Bone early. If you don't have anything special, then I usually recommend just losing the Max Health. Max Health is 
fairly affordable to give away in Act 1. There are a couple events in Act 1 that'll ask us to trade it away, and I'll usually recommend uh, giving up the Max Health, because in Act 1, usually what matters is trying to get your run as strong as possible, as quickly as possible. And giving up max health really interferes with you less. If you smash, you're going to have to, to rest, lose out on an upgrade. If you have a curse, you're going to take more damage in combats. Losing the max health doesn't really cost you. That's usually my advice. Take the max health for the golden idol, but do consider the other options. If you have an abundance of healing, take the damage. If you have curse synergies or an easy curse mitigation, take the, take the curse. Okay, next up, the living wall. Another three choice event here. This is another tough one. As you come to a dead end and begin to turn around, walls slam down from the ceiling, trapping you. Three faces materialize from the walls and speak. Forget what you know, and I'll let you go. I require change to see a new space. If you want to pass me, then you must grow. You're offered the choice to forget, change, or grow. Remove, transform, or upgrade. All of these are very good things, and this is one of the better events to see in Act 1. Um, but you don't always want to take... Uh, figuring out which one is best is, is going to depend on your run. And my usual philosophy is this. Removing a card simply slims down the deck. It gets rid of the worst card in your deck. If you've got a curse, that can be particularly worth it. But removing a card is only going to really help your run if you already have immediate threats sorted. So your run must be able to defeat the elites of Act 1, or more specifically, the boss of your act. So I'd say if this run can beat Guardian, we can afford to remove. Otherwise, you may wish to transform a card. Transforming is to remove a card and add a new random card. I highly advocate transforming starter cards. This is often your best play, although it won't always work out. I'd say transforms are, are good for the player maybe 90% of the time. You have equal odds of getting all of the different cards available to your character when you transform. So you really do not know what you're going to get, and you have no way of knowing the odds uh, either. It's all equal chance of every different card. I advocate for transforms in situations where you haven't added many cards to the deck, um, but you don't have an immediate problem to solve. Upgrade gives you an immediate boost of power in a predictable way. You can improve the damage of one card or the block of one card or the energy cost of one card uh, in a way that you know is going to help you. And this to me is most useful when you have an immediate elite threat. There's an elite node that's coming up. You don't feel like you're strong enough to handle it and you need a boost of power in a way that is predictable. That's when upgrade is best for me in act one. So my, my advice here, if you can beat the boss of the act, remove. If you cannot beat the boss, but don't have any immediate threats, transform. If you have an elite that you're going to fight very shortly, upgrade instead. Um, but sometimes it's worth it just to remove a curse, and that's what our little ironclad will do here, is remove that regret curse. Alright, what's next in the event list here? Scrap Ooze. Another early one. Event Scrap Ooze. As you walk into the room, you hear a gurgling and the grinding of metals. Before you is a slime-like creature that ate too much scrap for its own good. From the center of the creature, you see glints of the strange light. Perhaps something magical? It looks like you can get some treasure if you just reach inside its opening. However, the acid and sharp objects may hurt. This is a, uh, a tough lesson in, in likelihoods here. Scrap Ooze is a, a nasty, nasty little event. You're offered a chance at a relic if only you're willing to lose some health. If you fail to get the relic, then the price to reach in again increases. You take more damage, but so does the chance to find the relic. So it's a question of how much health are you willing to sacrifice to gain a relic? This one changes quite a bit uh, based on the Ascension level. 
The breach and side damage begins at three prior to Ascension 15 and then increases to five. So it starts at three and then increases by one uh, each time you reach inside. So earlier Ascension, three, four, five, six. Higher Ascension, five, six, seven, eight. That adds up to quite a bit of additional damage very, very fast. You have, I think, about a 50-50 odds of getting the relic within three clicks. Let's see, it's point... 75 times 0. 0.65. 0. 0.55. No, it's uh, about 50% a chance to get it in two clicks. 75% chance to get it in three clicks, looks like. It's the cumulative chance of 25%, 35%, so on. Let's see how many clicks we take this time. Click once. Ouch. So it goes up to six and 35%. Second time. Ouch. Lose seven at 45%. We get it on the third click here, and you're you're pretty likely to get it in three clicks, but there's always a chance that the scrap ooze may require six or seven clicks, which would cost you almost all of your health. So my advice with scrap ooze is you have to figure out how much health you're in a position to lose prior to prior to doing it. If you just click on this event as many times as you have health for, you're going to die pretty quick. So my usual philosophy is figure out uh, how much health you can afford to lose. Uh, you know, how many fights are there to the next rest site? How much health do you expect to lose in those combats? How much health do you need to get through the next few challenges until you know you can heal? And then figure out how many clicks of damage you can afford in this way. It's kind of similar to figuring out how many times you should click on money uh, in the Knowing a Skull event in Act 2. We'll talk about that in our next video. But it, you, you have to be able to evaluate how much spare health you have, and that's what makes this event so deadly. So my usual advice is, uh, is figure out beforehand, uh, do, can I afford two clicks, three clicks, four clicks, um, or can I really not afford to lose health at all? I, I sometimes have just walked past this event. Uh, without clicking at all on a winning run, but it can often be worth it to dig, as you're trading, on average, um, 12 or 19 health for for a relic, and that's pretty good. Oh, sorry, at 11 or 18. Anyhow, next up. The Shining Light. You feel a shimmering mass of light encompassing the center of the room. Its warm glow and enchanting patterns invite you in. You're offered a random two upgrades in exchange for 20 of your health. This one can be really, really nasty. You lose a lot of health. Um, specifically, this event is 30% of your health on Ascension 15 and above and 20% of your health, your maximum health, uh, lower than that. On High Ascension, coincidentally, the amount of health lost is exactly equal to the amount of health you can gain at a rest site. So often how I look at this event is a question to myself. Is it worth giving up one upgrade of my choosing to gain two upgrades at random? And the question depends ultimately on your deck. Often I think two upgrades is better than one, even if you don't get to choose where they go. Upgrading one strike and one defend can be very, very useful in Act 1. But this event gets more useful to you the more cards you've added to your starting deck and the more starter cards that you've removed from the starting deck because then you'll have a random chance to hit up a better cards like a Shrug It Off or a Cleave or a Whirlwind or whatever we've added to the starting deck. And this is one of the reasons that I advise going combats early in a Slay the Spire run rather than spamming events because the more non-starter cards you have, the better events like this become. Let's see what this, this Ironclad gets. That health is going down. Ironclad upgrades to defense. Okay. So, of course, you you just generally want to skip that event if you don't have health to spare. Um, so if you're low on health or if you've got an elite fight that's coming up, then you don't want to take the two random upgrades for Shining Light. As so you walk through the light, you notice that the light is absorbed into you. It's scorching hot, but the pain quickly recedes. So if you don't have the opportunity to up, uh, to heal up anytime soon, or if you have one upgrade that really, really matters, 
more than anything else. Let's say you've got uh, a whirlwind on ironclad and you need to be able to hit all enemies for big damage. That might be more important than two random upgrades. But always consider that the Shining Light can upgrade that one card you were going to upgrade anyway, and you might get a bonus upgrade besides, and that's, well, pretty tempting. I'd say I take Shining Light's upgrades 80 to 90% of the time that I see it. It's usually worth it, but not always. Next in the list, the Cleric, the Blue Abs Man. The, the Cleric. Strange blue humanoid with a golden helm approaches you with a huge smile. Hello, friend. I am Cleric. Are you interested in my services? The creature shouts loudly. Cleric gives you two paid options, a heal. It's 20% of your maximum health for 35 gold. This, this does not, I believe, change with the Ascension modifier. And then this one does. On low Ascension... Cleric will charge 50 gold on higher ascension 75 gold to remove a card from your deck, which is essentially what the sh shop costs. Worth noting, though, that events, uh, removals you get from events, like all other event removals, do not count against the removal price at the shop. So paying Cleric 75 gold here for a card remove is a discount in my eyes because it's as cheap as a remove will ever be, and you're always offered a limited number of removes in a Sleep the Spire run. If you don't need the heal, that's my recommended advice here. Pay out the 75 gold for the card remove. You might want to consider not paying Cleric at all if you have the membership card relic, causing shop prices to be half off because Cleric won't give you a discount. You're not a membership. You're not a member of Cleric's Club, just the shop. So Cleric will be charging full price. That said, if you're missing health, the 35 gold for the heal is quite a deal. Note that the heal... Um, may not necessarily be better for you than the remove, but it is 40 gold cheaper or 15 gold cheaper on the lower ascensions. And having a bit more money moving forward can help a lot too. So my broad advice, if, you, if you're missing the amount of health that Cleric heals you in Act 1, it's almost always worth it to get some more health. So pay for the heal if you need it. Um, but otherwise, pay out for that remove because it's super worth it. Only leave if you have uh, an extreme reason to keep your money. And uh, note that Cleric here will not appear if you do not have enough money to at least afford his healing service. So if you have less than 35 gold, Cleric will not show up as an eligible event for you. A warm golden light envelops your body and dissipates. Cleric best healer, have a good day. Thank you, Cleric. Please play your, pay your Cleric. The Serpent. Get a hundred and... Uh, blah, that's the next event here. Event Serpent. The Serpent. Let's look up what this one's called. Liar's Game. It's a fun internal name. The Serpent. You walk into a room to find a large hole in the ground. As you approach the hole, an enormous serpent creature appears from within. Ho, ho! Hello, hello! What have we got here? Hello, adventurer. I ask a simple question. The most fulfilling of lives is that in which you can buy anything. Do you agree? You can either agree with the snake or disagree with the snake. If you agree, you get 150 gold and a doubt curse. This curse is pretty bad. Not the worst of all curses um, in Act 1, certainly, but it's definitely a big detriment to you. And if you have to take this through any number of floors, especially an elite fight or a boss fight, this curse will really hurt you. The gold you get from the serpent really isn't that much either. 150 is not a great deal here um, compared to some of the other options we'll see later in this video. So generally speaking, I'd say your default option, a default response to the serpent should be to refuse, to disagree with the serpent. It's just not a good enough deal. You'll get uh, 70, uh, 25 more gold from this serpent on low ascension. It'll be 175 gold for agreeing, and that makes it a little bit more worth it, but still usually not. So when should you agree to the serpent's deal? I'd say you should agree if there's a shop coming up immediately, and you might be able to use that extra money 
better. Uh, often the, the math I do is uh, it's 75 gold to remove a card at the first shop. So if you take the curse and remove it at the first store, you still have 75 gold of additional purchasing power to, to make work in that shop. And that can bring you over some key thresholds, uh, notably 150-ish for a relic uh, at the shop can be really nice. Early in a run, this can put you over the threshold to, have, to afford an actual relic in the first shop, and, and that can really shape your run. So it might be worth considering if there's a shop coming up immediately. As with the other curse options, this can also be worth considering, not necessarily guaranteed worth taking, but at least worth considering if you have a relic that interacts with curses, such as Omo Moraisa block it, in which case it's a free 150 gold, or Darkstone Periapt, which would give you 6 max health and 150 gold, and, and that can be worth it. But uh, not always. If you agree, money will rain down on you. Serpent rears its head and blasts a stream of gold upwards. It is amazing and terrifying simultaneously. You gather all the gold, thank the snake, and get going. Don't forget to thank the snake if you do take their deal. But like I said, usually, usually not worth. You should not take the Serpent's deal here. All right, what's our last? Two more regular events to talk about um, without a floor restriction. More on the those in a moment. The Wing Statue is next. And I also have to look up what this one's called. Golden Wing. Among the stone and boulders, you notice an intricate blue statue resembling a wing. You find gold spilling from its cracks. Maybe there is more inside. This is a very interesting event in that it's one of the few with a, a locked option that requires a card with specific parameters. Here you can pray to lose health for a removal. Or if you have a, an attack card that has a base damage of 10 or more, you can break the statue open and get money. Something like 75 to... Actually, how much is it exactly? 50 to 80 gold is the exact amount of money that, that this will give you. Not a huge amount of cash, but uh, worth considering if you... Especially if you have um, discounted merchants with either the career or the membership card. Money can be worth it. But broadly speaking, the card removal is worth far more than the money that you would get from this locked event. So my usual advocation here is remove a card, a starter card if you've got one, a strike or defend, always worth getting rid of in Act 1, uh, or a curse if you've got one, that you shouldn't have one in the first place. Um, and only if you cannot afford the 7 health loss should you even consider one of the other options, really. So if you need that 7 health immediately because you're below 7 health or you're about to go into a fight and every hit point is critical, then maybe you can't get, maybe you can't afford the health loss to get that card removed, but usually card removes are worth it. So my strong re advice is remove card if possible, gain money if you're really, really low on health, um, and leave is only to be used in the most desperate of situations here. Let's pray. Someone once told you of a cult that worshipped a giant bird. As you kneel in prayer, you begin to feel lightheaded. You wake up some time later feeling strangely fleet of foot. All right, next up we have the World of Goop. One of the less good events. Like many events in Act 1, this one can hurt you. You fall into a puddle. It's made of slime goop. Frantically, you claw yourself out over several minutes as you feel the goop starting to burn. You can feel your goop in your ears, goop in your nose, goop everywhere. Climbing out, you notice that some of your gold is missing. Looking back to the puddle, you see your missing coins combined with gold from unfortunate adventurers together in the puddle. Here, you can either gather some money up, you gain some cash but lose health, or if you choose not to lose the health, you lose money, and that is uh, that is pretty bad. This event is is quite rough. It essentially imposes a penalty upon you, and asks you to take a different penalty in over in order to um, negate the first penalty, penalty of gold. And if you opt to lose health, you can get that gold back and then some. And that's pretty bad. You should consider the the total amount that you're gaining to be the difference between the gather gold and the leave it options. So. 
Um, we either gain 75 or lose 57. That's a combined difference of 75 plus 57 is equal to 132 gold difference between option A or option B. So the way you should look at this is, are 11 hit points worth 132 gold? Because that's the, the total swing that you'll be experiencing between the two options. I'd say usually it's worth it to gather gold here, unless again, you actually need that health. The most important hit point is the last one. So Slay the Spire is all a, a game of figuring out how many hit points you have to spare and how many you're gonna need. The better you are in combats, the more likely you are to be able to afford giving up some health for money. I'll gather some gold here. Feeling the sting of the goop as the prolonged exposure starts to melt away at your skin, you manage to fish out the gold. Better, of course, with a uh, shop coming up too. Uh, if there's no shop left in the act that you can get to, it's often more worthwhile to consider skipping there, even though the gold penalty does feel pretty bad. Uh, it, it always feels bad taking a penalty from an event in Slay the Spire. One of the best ways to not have that happen, don't go to the events. But I'm here to tell you what to do in the events, not uh, that you shouldn't go to them. So those are all the basic events of Act 1. I will now show you a couple of events that have a restriction on when they can appear. In Act 1, the Mushrooms event and the Dead Adventurer event can only appear on Floor 7s or, or later with the, uh, with the magic of console commands. We can make them appear earlier, though. So let's summon the Mushrooms first. This is the event you see. You enter a corridor full of hypnotizing colored mushrooms. Due to your lack of specialization in mycology, you are unable to identify the specimens. You want to escape, but feel oddly compelled to eat a mushroom. You have either a choice, stomp and fight mushrooms, or take a heal, 20% of your max health heal, and become cursed with a parasite. Yet another event offering you a curse here. Uh, in this case, it's either take a curse with an upside or take a fight. And what the game doesn't spell out to you is that the fight is rewarding. Uh, at no point are you told up front that you're going to get a relic for winning the fight, but you will. So let's break this down a little bit more. Um, this fight is quite nasty. I'll show it in a, a second here. It's up against three fungi beasts. There's a fight you can fight normally against two of them in Act 1, but this one puts you up against three at a time, and that can be really, really nasty. This fight will require you to deal quite a bit of damage quite quickly, so if your deck is lacking damage, particularly the ability to damage multiple foes at the same time, you might want to consider eating the mushrooms just to avoid the combat that you're about to get into. But if you think you can handle them, then you should absolutely anger the mushroom. Rodents infested by the mushrooms appear out of nowhere. You'll be put into a fight with three fungi beasts. Thankfully, our Niao's Lament here takes care of them. But in this fight, each of these fungi beasts will either attack you or buff their strength. Um, and if you kill any one of them, you'll become vulnerable. So the real problem here is that you're up against three opponents. Uh, if you kill one, the other two do 50% more damage to you. And so the combined damage is still probably the same from the remaining two. You have to be able to kill two of them quickly for this fight to go well. Uh, and the best way to do that is with any kind of area damage card. Uh, cleave on Ironclad, Dagger Spray on Silent, an Explosive Potion, what have you. Anything that can kill these things quickly will help a lot. So be warned, this is a pretty scary fight. But if you win it, you'll be well rewarded. The fight drops... Um, very intriguingly, between 20 and 30 gold, a little bit more than a regular fight, but a little bit less than an elite fight. There's actually no other fights, to my knowledge, that drop exactly this much money. As well as a unique event relic, the Odd Mushroom, which reduces the damage you take when you're vulnerable. This is very, very useful later in the run. If you get it early enough, it could be useful against Grumlin Knob in Act 1. Uh, and there's a lot of things in Act 2, 3, and 4 that apply vulnerable and it helps in all of those situations. You might also get uh, a potion, and of course you'll get another card reward. Let's take a combust for this clad. So that's the easier of the combat events in Act 1. Again, this, com th that event can only spawn on floor 7 or later. 
So starting here, these question marks could have could roll the dead adventurer or the mushroom fight, but early come early question marks won't be able to spawn this event or the next one here, which is event dead adventurer. This one's also quite unique. In Act One, you come across a dead adventurer on the floor. His pants have been stolen. Also, he looks to have been eviscerated and chopped by giant claws. Though his possessions are still intact, you're in no mind to find out what happened here. You have two options. Either search the remains and get loot or leave. There's a chance when you search that the monster returns, and this chance is higher on high ascensions. I believe it starts at 25% for uh, lower than ascension 15. If the monster returns, you'll be fighting one of the Act 1 elites. The Gremlin Knob, Lagivulin, or Sentry is the same enemies that you can fight in the Elite nodes here. And the event text actually tells you which of the three you'll be encountering. This line here, he looks to have been eviscerated and chopped by giant claws, will be replaced by other text um, for the other elites. Eviscerated and chopped by giant claws refers to Lagivulin, the sort of conch shell elite in Act 1, but it'll say, uh, Gouged and trampled by a horned beast if you're facing the Kremlin knob. And scorched? Scorched and burned? If you're fighting the three sentries, something like that. Scoured by flames is what it'll say. Scoured by flames for the three sentries. So you actually know exactly which fight you're about to get into. And this tests your ability to, um, to know your matchups. If you can win the fight... Uh, against the elites, then this is a very, very rewarding event, potentially. And if you're a little lucky, it can still be very rewarding. But if this elite is dangerous to you, then this event can be a very quick way to die. So, firstly, you should know how well you're going to fare in an elite fight, whether you can beat Lagavulin from the knob or the other. Uh, and then there's one more important thing to know, and I'm actually glad we get to show it here which is that specifically the Lagavulin in this event isn't a normal Lagavulin. Normally when you encounter Lagavulin in Act 1, they're sleeping, and you have a couple of turns to do stuff before they wake up and start attacking you. But you can't be ambushed by a sleeping creature. So if the monster returns, and they might not, you might just find what you're looking for, in which case you're allowed to search again. And if you find that, you can search again. If you roll successfully three times in a row, you'll search all the belongings without a hitch, and you'll get out of there. But this is a pretty unlikely outcome. If you do fight the elite, then uh, they'll drop the rewards from a normal elite combat minus what you have found already. So if you find the relic, then beating the combat will not give you another relic. And if you find the money, then beating the combat will give you less money. But even if you find both the money and the relic, you'll still get some more money and a card reward and maybe a potion if you beat the elite. So it can be, if you're able to defeat the elite, worth it to take the fight. Um, but if you know you're going to get stomped, absolutely don't take the fight in the dead adventurer, but dead adventurer fight. I guess I won't show the uh, the Lagavulin being awake. But yeah, a special warning, if it's Lagavulin eviscerated and chopped by giant claws, instead of being asleep on turn one, the Lagavulin will be debuffing you on turn one, and that makes the fight extra super deadly. So in particular, if you see eviscerated and chopped by giant claws, I recommend running far, far away from the dead adventurer and not searching. Just quick advice. So those are all of the events, the common events that can be seen in Act 1. But events are only one of several outcomes you can get from a question mark room. When you visit a question mark room, the options are event, we just went through all those, shrine, which are a, a special kind of event that are able to be seen in multiple acts especially. You can also randomly get a fight, shop, or treasure. And note that when you go to an event room, the events, uh, the odds change. So these are the starting odds for what your first event room will be in, in Slay the Spire. But these odds are always changing as uh, events occur here.
shrines are about one-fourth as likely as events. They're uh, a rarer subclass of events, uh, and there are quite a few different shrines. We'll be going through all the ones you can find in Act 1 here uh, in the second half of this video now, and talking about what you should do at each of these, as well as talking a little bit about the spawn conditions for each of them. So, first on the list of things that we can encounter in Act 1, uh, we'll go back to note for yourself in a moment. Bonfire Spirits is an event that you might see in Act 1. Very classic one. Bonfire Elementals, they're called, internally. And it looks like this. You happen upon a group of what look like purple fire spirits dancing around a large bonfire. The spirits toss small bones and fragments into the fire, which brilliantly erupts each time. As you approach, the spirits all turn to you expectantly. You have to offer a card from your deck here, one of the cards to remove. You're actually, interestingly enough, not allowed to choose not to remove a card. You must remove something in your deck. And what you give them will affect what you get in return. Specifically, they offer healing for higher rarity cards. Your starter cards, your strikes, defends, and bash um, will give you nothing. The flames will fizzle out and you won't get any reward from the spirits, but you still will remove the card in question. And that's important. If you give up a common card, not one of your starters, but still a card that has a gray border on top, then you'll gain a five hit point heal. If you give up an uncommon card with a blue border, you'll be healed to full health. And if you give up a rare card with a yellow border, you'll be healed to full health and gain 10 max health permanently making your run uh, last a little bit longer. Lastly, if you give up a curse card, you happen to have a curse to get rid of, then you can give it up to the bonfire spirits and gain a special relic called the spirit poop. In this case, I'm going to give up a shrug to show off that five hit point heal for uh, a common here. Uh, my usual advice on this one, if you're low on health, it can definitely be worth considering giving up one of your more useful cards. Uh, in particular, if you've got a rare card, especially an unupgraded rare card, to give up. Gaining 10 max health is very, very valuable, but your rare cards might form part of your key strategy, in which case you might be better off simply removing one of your starter cards. Never, never go. It's never wrong to simply remove a strike or a defend at this event. Um, but if you need a heal, giving up a more valuable card, something you can afford to lose, something that's not useful right now, something that's weighing you down, uh, is, a, is a good advice. So if we lose the Shrug it off, the flames grow slightly brighter. Spirits continue dancing. We feel slightly warmer from their presence and heal five health. It's the Bonfire Spirits. The Duplicator. This can really appear in Act 1. We'll talk about it very briefly. I, think, I feel like Duplicator is only Act 2 or 3. The Duplicator allows you to duplicate any card in your deck. My usual advice is to duplicate your best card. Two copies of your best card is better than one. Uh, notably, if you duplicate an upgraded card in this event, you'll get a second upgraded card. So, ideally, your best upgraded card with a set of starter cards just to defend plus. A ghastly mirror image appears from the shrine and collides into you. Not much use for duplicating bad cards, necessarily. Um, getting a second copy of your best power can be useful. But there's not a whole lot of reason to, uh, to duplicate stuff that's not particularly useful. You are allowed to duplicate curses here at the Duplicator. Even the Ascender's Bane is allowed to be duplicated. And there, there's maybe some very niche situations where you want to duplicate a curse, such as with uh, Duvu Doll or something, or if you're going for score on a daily run, perhaps. But generally speaking, you don't want to do that. Still, it's worth pointing out that you are allowed. Also worth pointing out that if you have any of the egg relics, Toxic Egg, Frozen Egg, or Molten Egg... Um, and you duplicate an unupgraded card of the appropriate type, the Egg Relic will upgrade the duplicated version. So if you have Molten Egg and you duplicate a Strike, you'll get a Strike Plus. And that's kind of cool, too. That can help your decision-making a little bit. 
The Face Trader. Oh, one of my favorites. Oops. You walk by an eerie statue holding several masks. Something behind you softly whispers, Stop. Swerve around to face the statue, which is now facing you. On closer inspection, it's not a statue, but a statuesque gaunt man. Is he even breathing? You're offered the ability to touch, trade, or leave. If you touch, you lose health and gain some gold. A little bit more gold on lower ascension levels. If you trade, you get a relic, which is a... The game says 50% chance good face, 50% bad face. That's not quite true. There are specifically five relics you can get. So let's just add them. Let's just add them all so that you can see them each. They are the Gremlin... Gremlin mask? Yeah. Gremlin loss, hungry face. Cultist mask. Face of cleric. Cleric face? Relic add. Face of cleric. And... Serpent head. These are the five different face relics that you can get from this event. The two bad ones. Gremlin Visage makes you weak on turn one of every fight. One turn of dealing 25% less damage. Most crucially, the, in, the first and perhaps most important turn of the fight. This can really set you back in a lot of combat, especially in Act 2. So that's a little bit bad. The other one is In-Law's Hungry Face. Your next non-boss chest is empty. And that includes there won't be a blue key in it. So, uh, very important to note that the Unlost Hungry Face Relic can cause you to miss out on your chance to get the blue key if there's only one chest remaining in your run. This one's also a, a fairly big inconvenience. You lose out on one relic for the In-Law's Hungry Face. There's one neutral face, the Cultist Headpiece. You feel more talkative, and this will cause you to go caw on turn one of each combat. It doesn't have any gameplay effect, but it is very fun. Then the, lastly, the two good faces are super good. Face of Cleric gives you one max health at the end of each combat. A usual run of Slay the Spire from beginning to end has around 30, com 30 combats in it. So a Face of Cleric gotten at the very beginning of the game is more than twice as strong as a Mango by the end of the run. Very, very, very powerful. Likewise, the Serpent Head says whenever you enter a question mark room, gain 50 gold in addition to the outcome of the question mark room. This is another incredibly powerful relic that gives you a ton of free resource. Easily 500 gold during a run if you get it early again, which is better than a, an old coin by almost twice as much. All told, you have two relics that have, as, as I see it, moderate to light downsides and two relics that as i see it have incredibly powerful upsides which to me means that this is a on average good trade to take the face um, so i i do usually recommend making the trade because the good faces are better than the bad faces are worse essentially so even with even odds you're you're benefiting on average uh, but you may not necessarily feel that way, especially if you're playing a run and you're weak on turn one of every combat. Most notably, the faces that are good are also better the earlier in the run you get them for more events or more combats left during the run. So I only really strongly advocate for the face trade in Act 1. Otherwise, you should consider losing health for money um, or even just leaving outright. If you don't want to lose health or you don't want to risk a bad face, then leave is your option. But... I, I do advocate face trade quite strongly, especially the earlier in the run you are, the better the trade is. It's true, you're also allowed to save and quit to, uh, to know what face you're getting and unmake the choice if you want to, but that's, that's definitely, definitely cheating to use uh, save and quit to, to know the outcome events, like the, the match and keep too, you can do that in. Well, that's, that's a little cheaty. Compensation? Compensation. Mechanically, he cranes out a neat stack of gold and places it into your pouch. What a nice face. Nice face. While he touches your face, you begin to feel your life drain out of it. 
During this, his mask falls off and shatters. Screaming, he quickly covers his face with all six arms, dropping even more masks. Amidst all the screaming and shattering, you escape. His face was completely blank. It's a very creepy event. Is also what I'll say about Face Trader. You are a weird person, Face Trader. You are a weird person. Alright, to change our music here, I'm going to visit this event node. I'm not 100% sure if this will work properly. Oh, good. Alright, now I get to talk about the Match and Keep as our next event. This is also a Shrine event. The Match and Keep. A gremlin is madly shuffling cards on a table. A gremlin seems to be a harmless one. You approach him out of curiosity. Twelve cards! Match them to keep them. Five tries, no do-overs. Uh, like some of the other shrine events in Slay the Spire, you can actually encounter this up to three times in the same run. Uh, you can encounter... You can't encounter an event twice in the same act, but you can encounter an event twice in different acts. Uh, and this is one of those events that can appear in multiple acts. You're given this array of 12 cards, five chances to click on two of them. Ultimately, wherever you, there's no strategy to where you click first. Uh, I usually go top left just for convenience, but there's, there's no really way to know at all what your first card is going to be. This event does change quite a bit with Ascension levels. Uh, normally, there's, there's always uh, six paired cards here. Uh, normally, one pair of curses, one pair of colorless cards, uncommon colorless cards, I think specifically, one pair of a starter card from your character. For Ironclad, that's going to be Bash. One common iron card from your character, one uncommon card from your character, but two commons, rather, two uncommons, and then two rares, a pair of rares for 12 cards total. If you're above Ascension 15, then the uncommon colorless pair is replaced with a second curse pair. And that second curse pair can be identical to the first curse pair. So for example, there can be four normality curses in the match and keep event. And revealing any two of those will add them to your deck. Makes this particularly nasty on high Ascension. Regardless of where you click on the first card, again, there's no strategy for the second card. You have to pick a new card. And there's no way to know whether the one you click on is going to be what matches the first one. Let's click in the, the other middle here. We see an injury and a pommel strike. Once you've revealed two cards that you know, the strategy that I s follow is to reveal a new card with your pick. If you're willing to add the new card to your deck, then click on another new card. If you are not willing to add the new card to your deck, then you should click on one of the cards you have already revealed. In this case, we reveal a curse. If I click on a new card, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine cards I don't know the identity of here. So you have a one in nine chance to, that I click on the clumsy if I click on an unknown card, um, and an eight in a nine chance that I'll reveal a new card and get some more information. Usually I advocate that the ch new information is not worth the chance of the added curse. So in this case, I'll click on the pommel strike that I know is there. Now I can click on another new card which is a rare card, Juggernaut. That I would be willing to add to my deck. So we get to click on another new card. It is the Juggernaut, and they get matched. Let's see, what's here? Evolve? I would also be willing to add Evolve, so let's click on another new card. It's the other Clumsy. And lastly, we can click on one more card. It's the other Pommel Strike. We can either click on a card other than Pommel Strike and don't add the Pommel Strike, or at this point we could choose to add the Pommel Strike. And sure, why not? So we end up with two cards added there. But that's that's my usual strategy. If you're willing to add the card that you see, click on a new card. If you're not willing to add it, click on a card you already know. And unfortunately, there's nothing you can do to help your odds on the first two clicks. There's just, it doesn't, it's, it's cruel fate. If you get a curse, know that there was nothing you could do other than save and quit, which will work here. All right, who's next on the shrine list here? Golden Shrine. For you lives an elaborate shrine to an ancient spirit. You can either pray to gain some money. Interestingly, only the pray option is changed on lower ascension here. Prior to ascension 15, 
Uh, Prey gives you 100 gold, but I think Desecrate is still 275 and a Regret Curse. This is a much better deal than the Serpent offers you. The, the Serpent offers you either 150 gold or um, 175, depending on your Ascension level, for a Doubt Curse. But this shrine offers you 275, or if you want to look at it, you can, since you can pray without getting the curse, you can look at this as 225 gold for the curse. Uh, the difference between praying and desecrating. And that's a much better deal. 225 gold minus the 75 gold for card removal, or better yet, I mean, it is actually 275 gold, so you probably should weigh it at the full 275. Minus the 75 from a removal leaves you with a full 200 surplus gold to enter the next shop with. And if you have the 99 gold from the start of the run, that should be enough to push you into the ability to afford a rare relic at a shop, which is very, very useful indeed. So unlike the Serpent, I would say it's usually worth it to desecrate the Shrine for the Curse so long as you can path into a shop in the near future uh, and spend some of that money. The amount of money you get is super duper worth it from this curse. Each time you shrike the shrine, gold pours forth again and again. But as you pocket the riches, something weighs heavily on you. And that curse is bad. It's a regret curse, which causes you to lose health. So this is only going to be worth it if you can get to a store reliably. If you have to path through elites or multiple combats or worse yet, a boss before your next shop arrives, then it's not going to be worth it to take the curse, because the downside from the curse will hurt you too much. So, take the money if you can get to a shop, otherwise, don't, is my advice for the Golden Shrine. The Lab. This one's pretty straightforward. Capital L. In the lab, you find yourself in a room filled with stacks of test tubes, beakers, flasks, forceps, pinch clamps, stirring rods, tongs, goggles, funnels, pipettes, cylinders, condensers, and even a rare spiral tube of glass. Why do you know the name of all these tools? It doesn't matter. You take a look around. Here you'll find some potions. Uh, two. You might get three potions on uh, lower ascension here, but you just get two random potions on high ascension. No choice to make here. You just get a reward and pick up. Uh, although you may have to make some choices about which potion is better than the others. Generally speaking, in Act 1, I tend to value potions that can deal damage above anything else. So Fire Potion, Fear Potion, uh, Blessing of the Forge, Explosive Potion are all very, very good. And things like the Cullis Potion, the Essence of Steel, and the Skill Potion. The, the ones we have here, as well as uh, Weak Potion, Liquid Bronze. These are all uh, lower-rated potions for me in Act 1. I've already done a, a potion tier list. But we could, we could maybe make another video talking about potions specifically, broken down. Alright, I'm going to visit the shop here to get the uh, event music to reset here. With all the money from events, we could afford quite a few nice things here. So, what's our next event? The Ominous Forge. Another classic one. Uh, Cursed Blacksmith, that's the one. You duck into a small hut. Inside you find what appears to be a forge. Smithing tools are covered with dust, yet a fire roars inside the furnace. You feel on edge. You can either forge, rummage, or leave. Basically no reason to leave, because the forge upgrade uh, option is, is always good. You either upgrade one card in your deck, or you rummage, gaining a curse and the warped tongs. Uh, of note, this event can appear in any act, but is probably the best if you see it in Act 1. The warped tongs relic are quite good. One random card in your hand upgraded every turn. So guaranteed something that you can play becomes upgraded. Um, the more upgrades you have, I tend to find the better the Warp Tongs actually feel because they're more reliable in what they'll upgrade, but overall they're quite strong. That said, the Pain Curse is a serious downside. You'll be behind one removal the whole run, uh, and you may lose health until you can get rid of this Pain Curse. 
So I don't usually advocate taking the warp tongs unless you can either remove that pain quickly or have another way to mitigate it strongly. Like a lot of healing or a blue candle or something like that. Oftentimes, I find myself just taking the single targeted upgrade. Upgrading random cards is not nearly as effective as upgrading a card of your choice, where you can target that upgrade for where it matters the most. Upgrading an important power or your best damage card or getting your draw upgraded, um, rather than having your strikes and defends be upgraded at random. So between the downside of the curse and the upside of choosing where the upgrade goes, I often find myself taking the the forge option here, upgrading a, a card of my choice and just choosing whatever my best upgrade is. But if you don't mind the pain curse, or you've got a shop coming up, um, or you have a lot of unupgraded cards, then the rummage can be more worth it. Particularly in boss fights, the warp tongs really, really helps out with the continual upgrades. Also worth noting, the Tungsten Rod Relic makes you immune to the damage from pain. That can make uh, carrying around the curse a lot less detrimental. Peace Pipe Relic could let you get rid of it. Um, for example, if this is your only way of getting upgrades, maybe you've got a Fusion Hammer in Act 2, although that won't apply to Act 1 here, then uh, taking the Warped Tongs can be worth it too. But do strongly consider that targeted upgrade. The curse isn't always worth it. Decide to see if you can find anything of use. After uncovering tarps, looking through boxes, and checking nooks and crannies, you find a dust-covered relic. Taking the relic, you can't shake a sudden feeling of a sharp pain as you exit the hut. Maybe you disturbed some sort of spirit? So here's what the warp tongues say. The cursed tongs emit a strong desire to return where they were stolen from. Start your turn, upgrade a random card in hand for the rest of the fights. Very cool. All right, let's reset our shop music here. Do the poor jaw worm a disservice. Sorry, jaw worm. So remaining events, purifier. That's a pretty straightforward one. Make sure I close this. Purifier is a removal shrine, essentially. An elaborate shrine to a forgotten spirit where you remove a card. As usual, removing the, the worst card applies. Remove a curse if you've got one, but otherwise, do remove a starter card. Getting rid of strikes and defends is almost always going to be a good investment in the long term, no matter what class you are. Uh, generally speaking, I recommend removing defends first on Watcher, removing strikes first on the other characters, but uh, it's not always as simple as that, and you should always consider the other factors. We'll lose this pain. The Divine Fountain. Fountain of Cleansing. So here's a, another, a very rare shrine event. This one, the Divine Fountain. Very unlikely to see this one in Act 1 in particular. Uh, uh, many players have expressed to me that they've played hundreds or even thousands of hours and never seen this event. You come across shimmering water flowing endlessly from a fountain on a nearby wall which allows you to remove all curses from your deck. You'll only see this event if you have removable curses in the first place. And it's a shrine event, as aforementioned, so it's a much lower chance to appear than a regular event. As you drink the water, you feel a dark grasp loosen. Let's sort out our music one more time here. Didn't I just fight you? Poor Jawworm. Hey, nice card. So a few shrines we haven't talked about yet. The woman in blue. From the darkness, an arm pulls you into a small shop. As your eyes adjust, you see a pale woman in sharp clothes gesturing towards a wall of potions. Buy a potion now, she states. You either buy one, two, or three potions for 20, 30, or 40 gold, respectively, or you refuse and she'll slap you, which only does damage on high ascension. If you're at a, a below ascension 15, uh, you may leave without penalty. She'll still slap you, but it won't actually hurt you. But on the higher ascensions, you will take damage for refusing to do business with a woman in blue. 
Usually, this is, this is a pretty good deal for potions. Even one potion for 20 gold is a good deal, and the deal gets better as you buy more. So I recommend buying multiple potions, two or three, um, ideally, rather than taking the damage, unless you really, really happen to need the gold. Uh, often I recommend buying potions equal to the number of empty potion slots you have, plus one. So if you have one empty potion slot, buy two. If you have two empty potion slots, buy three. That way you get a little bit of choice afterwards, but don't spend too much money. Um, but it's not wrong to just go buy three here and uh, look at the potions. Even if you have full potion slots, looking at more potions can give you better potions. For example, here in Act 1, I would definitely say Heart of Iron Fire Potion is better than Skill Potion, Strength Potion. So if you've got money to spare, dealing with a woman in blue can be well worth it. Even, again, if you've got full potion slots. Um... Especially if you have low health, because refusing and losing health is not a, a not a particularly desirable outcome as well. So since it's a good deal, I, I usually recommend purchasing at least two potions from the woman in blue. Now if you've got Sozu, or can't gain potions, might be a different story. Now leave. You got it, lady. Transmogrifier. Trans... Transmorgrifier? Do you see that? The devs misspelled it? Oh my god. <laughs> That's funny. Transmorgrifier, you got it. Well, at the Transmorgrification Shrine, you find an elaborate shrine to Forgotten Spirit. Here you can transform a card, which I almost always recommend taking advantage of. Uh, as aforementioned, transforming your worst card, either a strike or defend, is usually favorable for the player. Uh, and so, and given that you're you're getting this at essentially no cost, I, I highly recommend taking it. So in this case, I would transform a, a strike, in particular with because we got the Juggernaut, the defense are better. So here I would happily transform a strike. In this case, we get a twin strike, which is just better than a strike or that potion that just shop, showed up. Turning a strike into a twin strike is definitely an upgrade in my book, so always happy to see that. I'll upgrade Reaper. All right, a couple more events to show off to round out this video here. What's left? Upgrade Shrine. That's also pretty straightforward. I will show it off. Here you choose a card, you upgrade the card. Standard upgrade logic applies, the same logic you would use at a rest site. Choose the best upgrade, um, and I strongly recommend valuing the absolute numeric increase to the card. So for example, Twin Strike deals four more damage, two damage twice here, whereas a Strike upgrade is plus three, Bash upgrade is plus two and one more turn of Vulnerable. Uh, and power upgrades in particular can be really worth it. Making Combust go from 5 to 7 is, is good stuff. So that's probably what I would upgrade here. But standard upgrade logic applies. There's no choice really to make at the upgrade shrine other than which card you're upgrading. All right, hopefully this will... This will be either we meet again or we'll change. That works too, okay. We meet again. So Ranwid. Ranwid you can encounter in any act. Ranwid is also a shrine event. A cheery, disheveled fellow approaches you gleefully. You do not know this man. It's me, Ranwid. Have you any goods for me today? The usual. A fellow like me can't make it alone, you know. You eye him suspiciously and consider your options. Here for Ranwid, you can gain a relic and you get to choose your price. And just like the other choose your price um, golden shrine uh the Golden Idol, rather, an event in Act 1. Just like the Golden Idol event in Act 1, being able to choose your price means it's almost always worth it to take it. Because surely one of these things is worth a relic. A potion, chosen at random. A certain amount of money, chosen at random. Or a card, chosen at random from your deck. Uh, options will be grayed out if you don't have the required thing. Either a non-starter card, or a potion, or the money. You have to be able to afford at least one of Ranwood's prices for him to appear in the first place. So there is a spawn restriction on this. 
If you don't want to give up what Ranwood is asking for, then attack is your choice. Uh, if you attack Ranwid, then that ends the event without gaining the relic or losing anything. What a jerk you are sometimes. He runs away. But my advice in that one is the relic's almost always worth it. Just try to figure out what is the um, least costly thing you can give up. Money's usually pretty valuable, so I'm either trading away one of my potions or losing a card, but it ultimately depends on what card he asks for. He can ask for a common card late in the game, and it can even be a good thing to get rid of it, but if he asks for an important rare card early, then not so. Not so. All right. Event Wheel of Change. This is the penultimate event here. This is uh, the second Gremlet event, like the Match and Keep. Uh, just like the Match and Keep, this is a totally random and kind of cruelly unfair event because of it. You come across a dapper-looking, cheery gremlin. It's time to spin the wheel. Are you ready? Of course you are. There's six options on the wheel. Four are good, two are bad. And it's completely at random what you get. Two-thirds chance you get something good, one-third chance you get something bad. There's nothing you can do to change or affect this. You just spin the wheel and see what happens. And the options are, starting at the top here, the X is a card removal. You get to choose a card to remove from your deck. The blood splatter means the gremlin stabs you and you lose 10% of your max health. The pile of money gives you cash, specifically 100 gold times the act you're in. So 100 gold act one, 200 gold act two, 300 gold act three. Treasure chest is a random relic. The heart is a full heal. And the purple flaming card is a curse that gets permanently added to your deck without your consent. So two bad options, four good options. Totally random what you get. In this case, we win a prize. The gremlin can, in fact, stab you to death if you're below 10% of your maximum health. It's, uh, it's a sad way to go. A gift. A gift. So, no choice to make there. Just just hope that uh, that things turn out for you. And, and try not to go into events on critically low health. Because you never know when you might win death. Alright, so we've looked at all of the Shrine events and all of the Act 1 events that we're eligible for. There's one last one that I want to talk about that you can appear in Act 1, which is this one here, a note for yourself. Let's talk about that for a second. Note for yourself. So this is a event that many players have also never seen, kind of like the Curse Removal Shrine. It is possible to see this event in Act 1. This event is called A Note for Yourself. You spot a loot, loose brick within a pillar that catches your eye. A folded note and a card inside. It reads, The Heart Awaits. This is your handwriting. Many players have not seen this event because there's a, another weird spawn restriction on this one, specifically an ascension level based spawn restriction. This event cannot appear under two conditions. Condition one, you're playing on the highest unlocked Ascension level you have. So if you're trying to unlock a new Ascension level, you cannot find this event. Secondly, if the overall Ascension level is 15 or higher, this event can also not appear. So if you play on high Ascension levels, you'll not see it either. That means the only way to encounter this is to deliberately play on a lower Ascension level than is the maximum possible. Um, some play on Ascension 1 for fun, and they might see this event quite a bit. It's a pretty cool event overall. This is a card storage event. Initially, the card here is Iron Wave. Uh, and when you find this event, you're given the option to either take the card and store a new one, or ignore it. The card you take, no matter what character it's from, is permanently added to your deck. And then the card you lose is sealed away in the note for yourself event until the next time you see it. That card will be offered to you again on the next run. So you are able to use this event to remove a curse or otherwise undesirable card, but it'll be stored in there for the future. And the next time you see the event, there won't be a good card. Therefore, what I recommend doing is not getting rid of your worst card and taking what's inside, but rather trying to figure out a way to make a trade that is beneficial for both this run and a future run. Taking a, a card that could be useful now 
and storing something that will be useful potentially later in a future run. I'm going to take this opportunity to, to take this Hello World out of the, uh, the wall on this save file and replace it with this Reaper Plus, such that the next time we see this event on this save file, it'll contain an upgraded copy of Reaper. Now, you can only get away with that, of course, if you can afford to lose the card. Maybe I needed that Reaper Plus on this Ironclad run, but since this is just for a video, uh, I don't have to deal with the consequences of giving up that good card. But you in your own run will have to deal with not having the card you gave up in order to maybe get a cool run later on. What I like most about Note for Yourself is that it allows you to assemble cross-class interactions, get cards on characters that weren't originally intended to have them. Uh, and those can have little interesting effects. For example, we now have Hello World on Ironclad, which I'll actually play out in this Sentry's fight, just to show you what it does. Fight these fools. Got a bizarre mess of relics here. Again, not a, not a real run, but... Fun little demonstration, for sure. Like that, you die. So, the starting to turn at a random common card to your hand. It's a defect card. But the common cards we get are going to be Ironclad commons. A cleave on that turn. What do we get this turn? We're also showing off the Warp Tongues here. The Warp Tongues can upgrade the added common card. A Sword Boomerang this turn. So we're getting Ironclad common cards. That's a fun little interaction. Just one of the many, many cool things you can do with the Note for Yourself event. So, those are all of the different events that you can encounter in Act 1. There's a whole heck of a lot of them. Uh, and I hope I helped you figure out what to do at each of them and, and sort of how to, how to decision make when it comes to the events of Act 1. As a reminder, a lot of the rewards from the event, specifically removals, upgrades, etc., are better as your deck gets more cards in it. And so it's very important, especially at the beginning of Act 1, to not take too many events immediately, especially as tempting as it might be. Those events rarely give you card rewards. Note that we saw only, only two events in Act 1 that give you any form of card reward. Um... And you really do need those to be able to beat elites and beat your boss. So getting those first should be a top priority. Only once you have an initial set of cards do events really become appealing. But I hope this showed off the, the broad availability of events in Act 1, what they do for you, what they don't do for you, and what you should do in your Act 1 events. If you liked this video, please uh, drop me a like and subscribe below. Uh, I've also included a link in the description of this video below to the uh, info mod so that you can get a breakdown of events during your own runs um, by installing that into your mod mods folder. So you can find that there. Thank you so, so much for watching. I hope that this video was informative. Best of luck in your events out there, Spire Slayers, and stay tuned for Act 2 and 3 event breakdowns. Hey there, if you enjoyed that video, watch this one next. And before you go, join us on Twitch and watch live. I'm there five days a week playing Slay the Spire, answering questions and chilling with the community. Click the link in the description to follow right now. Ta-ta for now.